Hey, thanks for clicking in. Around here, we upload videos each and every week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you're watching this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Make sure you check out the description box below to find out how to do just that. As you're watching, you may also want to give to our ministry. There are many ways to do so, so utilize what works for you. Thanks for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. One thing that I think you will learn very quickly in life, especially as you get older, is how out of control you really are. It's, when you're younger, I, I think it's easy to feel like you're invincible and you have control of everything. But as you get older, you start to realize how much, not just how out of control of things you really are, but you start to realize just how much you need God. You start to realize as you get older that you can't control people. People are going to come and people are going to go in and out of your life. People are going to build you up and people are going to try to crucify you. You cannot control people. You, you, you can't control time. You'll make time and you'll make plans, but it's been said that the best way to make God laugh is to tell him your agenda. Because when you're really walking with God, God has a way of disrupting your life every single day. You have to be careful when you say, I want God to use me. Because once you say you want God to use you, what you are saying is, God, when you call, I will never hit ignore on the spiritual phone. And he may call you at 1 o'clock, and he may call you at 2 a.m., and he may call you at noon, and he may tell you to take off work, and he may tell you to not go on vacation, and he may tell you to sow something you didn't plan to sow. But when it's you and God, you release all control. This is why people that have to be in control struggle with faith. Because people that have to be in control cannot understand how God likes to step in and take full control. And that's not just with your time and it's not just with your money. It's with your marriage. The marriage that you had in mind is a marriage that before it's all said and done is going to look nothing like you had in mind. You'll find it with parenting that you, you can't control the kids. As they grow older, they will take their own journey. Part of it is they are half of you. <laughs> you are looking at you and you are mad at you. The other part is they are half of somebody else. And that half tends to creep out sometimes. The other thing is, is you pray for God to use your kids and not realizing that every child that is used has to go through a prodigal season. Do you think the prodigal son's father wanted him to run out of the house? Wanted him to sleep with prostitutes? Wanted him to spend all of his living on riotous living? Do you think he wanted him to sit in a hog's pen and hit rock bottom? But that is what you get when you say, Lord, user. Lord, use them. You cannot control the narrative. You just have to rest, especially with children, in those promises that are found in your big old book or big old app. Train them in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they will not depart. As you get older, you realize that you're not even in control of your own body. Sickness and pain start to creep in. And they actually become terrorist inside of you. You start to find out quickly. You are not in control. Even your career, one minute you get a promotion and the next minute they have to let you go. And sadly, with the emergence of AI, they say in the next five years, five years, y'all, Five years, America will have 70 million less jobs. Wow. So every time you get excited, 
that you don't have to stand and see a cashier because there's a quick checkout. Or you get to the airport and they don't need somebody to check your passport now no more. You just walk up to the machine and it recognizes you and lets you through. Every time you are convenienced, somebody else is inconvenienced. Every time you fly through Easy Pass, those are about 30 toll workers that don't have jobs no more. And they say 70 million more jobs are going to be cut. They say that we are experiencing the death of the middle class in the United States. It's going to be harder and harder to get a degree or get a job if you do not have STEM or STEAM training. And sadly, we're so caught up on having good church that we're going to blink and be the ones holding the cups on the corner. Wow. We are not in control. And that's okay. And truthfully, it's kind of freeing when you realize that it's okay to not be in control as long as I submit control to the God who loves to be in control. God loves to be in control. I remember as a young pastor starting this church at 25 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what budgeting looked like, what having an accountant looked like. I, I, I didn't know what church was really supposed to look like because I came out of storefront churches that were real good at having family style church, but they weren't real good at running an organization. And, and our church got to the place where in those churches, they didn't see a lot of resources coming in. Our church to this day has seen millions of dollars come in. I never got taught how to handle millions of dollars. I remember sitting with one of my mentors, Pastor John Jenkins, from First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, and I was in his office, and he actually said, my gift to you and your church is my accountant. But before we got to that place, he started asking me about money and how I was handling money, and he said, do me a favor, stand up real quick. And this is when we didn't really have nothing. He said, do me a favor, stand up real quick. And I stood up in his office, he said, put your hands behind your back. And I put my hands behind my back. He said, with those habits, that's what you're going to look like one day being walked out of your church. I didn't get trained in that kind of stuff. But I will tell you this early on, I learned this lesson. God will put you in places where you are not in control. You have to be in control of what God is giving you and everything that is out of your control, you have to give it to him. And really what God will do is he will put you in a place where Matthew 6, comes alive. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. A lot of church Churches stop at seek ye first the kingdom of God, but his righteousness means living right. Yeah. That's what they don't teach nowadays. You, you can't just put God first and live reckless. It's his righteousness. I'm not watching everything. I'm not listening to everything. I'm, I'm not hanging with everybody. I'm not going to the bar with my coworkers and killing my testimony. I'm not in the break room talking about my boss to my coworkers and acting like I don't have faith that God put me here maybe to change that person. But how can I change that person when they find out I'm talking about them? I'm living right. God knows we've all made mistakes. I've made mistakes that I don't even want to talk about. But there comes a point where you say, I can't shack up no more. Yes. I can't do this no more. I can't live like that any longer. Why? Because God has not only been good to me, yes. but I'm holding myself back. 
from all the things he wants to add into my life. So I'm seeking him first, and people are going to laugh about me, and people are going to talk about me, and that's okay. But I'm focused on something so much bigger than me. And he says, when you live like this, when you live like this, and let me say this, this is why accountability is so important. I got people that can take my phone at any given moment and read it. All my emails are scanned. My social media is monitored. Why? Because I refuse to risk God's hand on my life. Because whatever you do not hold accountable, like the money, eventually, it may be with your marriage, it may be with your family, it may be with your career, but whatever you do not hold accountable, will eventually take you captive. So he says, when you live like this, guess what? You don't have no thoughts, no reason to worry. That's what the unbelievers do. Just trust that God's got you. If there's a thing, God says, I can get it to you, but you got to put me first. This is why people that get into binds often lose it because what happens is you tend to choose the circumstance over putting God first. I had somebody come up to me some time back and they said, Pastor, and this was a season where the church was struggling. They said, you've been taking a lot of offerings lately. I said, well, well, number one, understand this. I haven't gotten a paycheck from this church in three years. So when I take an offering for this church, it is to pay this church's bills and do outreach. That's number one. Number two, I learned a lesson a long time ago. Whatever God needs for his church, because at the end of the day, this is his church. If it was my church, then nobody should say nothing when the church is being blessed if I took everything. But if this is our church, then the Bible says those that suffer together reign together. So if it's our church, then everything God needs for our church and his church is in the house. And I actually looked at the dude and I said, let me ask you a question. Do you tithe? He said, no. But I saw you just took a trip to Disney. And you choose Disney over putting God first. How dare you talk to me about trying to keep his kingdom moving forward? It's putting him first. So I've learned that when things go wrong to pray, but when praying does not work, it is not because God is absent. It's because God wants you to do an inventory of what is in your house. Everything God needs for you is within your reach. He will never drop manna in your mouth. He will drop it within your reach. Moses, Moses, Moses. What is in your hand? What is within your reach? Moses said a rod. Moses, you're stupid. This is a plague maker. This is a sea splitter. This is a water producer in a desert. This is not your rock. This is the staff of God. Could you be seeing a rod when God is telling you what I've given you is a miracle? Oh, oh, to the widow woman who, who is ready to lose her child, lose her children. And she says, I don't have nothing to use. I don't have nothing to give God. The prophet said, what is in your house? Nothing but a pot of oil. You see nothing. God sees something he could stretch. The problem is, whether it's Moses' rod or your pot of oil, it will always be nothing till you release it. When the rod left Moses' hand, it resurrected. When the pot of oil was passed on to God, it was stretched. 
What has God given you that you keep playing it safe with? Because you see nothing. And God is saying, I see something that could change generations to come. I see something that could bless your children when you're not here. I see something that could be passed down to your great-great-grandchildren. I see something that could get a business off the ground. I see a ministry. I see a song. I see a book. I see a dream. I see possibilities. But the problem isn't what does God see. It comes down to what do you see in what God has given you. Somebody could take that marriage you have and make a marriage ministry out of it. Somebody could take your family and get those kids to be youth ministers. Somebody could take your job and rise to the top and change the whole company. It's not that God does not want to bless you. It's that you are not looking at your life the right way. Look at somebody and say, what's in the house? Jesus was sitting around surrounded by 20,000 people, 5,000 men, not including women and children. And all of them had grumbling stomachs. All of them. Sometimes I'm up here late with Jamel and Kendra and Ursula and Amaris when they're practicing and Jalen. And I'll tell you what, they get here late sometimes or they stay late sometimes. And I hate to be around them when they're hungry because they start to get hangry. You all see the good version of the worship team? You don't see them on Wednesday night when it's 11 o'clock and they've been practicing, trying to get a song together for two hours and, and one person's just not getting it or they stay off key and everybody gets hangry? Oh, it's horrible. Being around hungry people is dangerous. 20,000 hungry people in the desert that gave up food to hear Jesus speak. Can you imagine giving up food? There are people on their phones right now setting up lunch plans after church. Can you imagine giving up food just to hear a word? And Jesus found out they were hungry. And he, he asked Philip a question. He said, hey, Philip, what would it take to feed all these people? But there's this little part in verse 6 that gets overlooked sometimes. This was a test. He already knew what he was going to do. It was a test. Whenever God puts you in a place where the demand seems bigger than your supply, how you respond is going to determine what God does. It was a test. It was a test. How do you respond when bills come in that you can't pay? How do you respond when the kids do things that you don't agree with? How do you respond when your marriage is at a place where your spouse does not want to be parented? Look at somebody and say, it's just a test. He already knew what he was going to do. Why? Because there's never a situation where the odds are against us and God does not have a plan. He has a plan for the soreness. He has a plan for the disease. He has a plan for the marriage. He has a plan for the child. He has a plan for the bills. He never puts you in something without also creating, the Bible says, a way of escape. What is God testing you with right now? And he has a way of putting you down to a little to see if you have faith that he can give you a lot. Little love. Little strength. Little time left. You feel like you're getting older. And as we're going to see, not realizing that if God kept you here, it's because your best glory is still to be seen. And you're so focused on what you don't have that you're missing out on a chance for God to show you his glory in a way you've never experienced it. And the danger in doubting God is look at the life of the prophet Elijah. He got down to a point where he thought he was all by himself as if that wasn't enough. 
all because of a threat, he went into suicide mode. And even when he found out there were 7,000 prophets that did not bow, that still wasn't enough. You have to be careful to not get to the place where you doubt that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you may ask or think because you will see him do it for others and wonder why he's skipping over your house. It's because you do not have faith to give him full control. Israel had lost their faith in God. They had gotten comfortable. They had begun to build up other things, other gods, other distractions. While they were in the land of Israel, God had Jeremiah, the prophet, warning them verse after verse after verse after verse, and they, they would not get it. So what did God have to do? He had to allow them to go through 70 years in captivity. The Babylonians, Mesopotamia, was at that point in history the most powerful civilization. They actually say that civilization was birthed out of Mesopotamia. It's where they believe the Garden of Eden was in between the rivers that are mentioned in Genesis. Right in Mesopotamia, right under Turkey, where Noah's Ark would land on that mountain. Babylon was the empire to be feared. It was bigger than Egypt, stronger than Rome at the time. It ran and controlled the land. It is actually where Babylon is today. That's where Abraham came out of, the land of Ur, the Chaldeans. And God would use this kingdom to take his people out of their land into a foreign land. And for 70 years, they would sit. In Psalms 137, it talks, it gives us a glimpse of how they were feeling in this season. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept and we remembered Zion. Have you ever had something in your life that was good and when you think about it, it just makes tears come down your eyes? You don't realize how much you love something until it's gone. If they would have cried when they were in Zion for God's goodness and provision, maybe they never would have lost it. It is possible to lose things because you get comfortable and start to take them for granted. We sat by the rivers of Babylon and we, we wept because we remembered Zion. We hanged up our hearts upon the wallows in the midst thereof. For they carried us away captive. They that carried us away captive required a song. And they wasted us, required myrrh. Sing to us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? There are seasons that can hit you that make it hard to even praise and worship. Death loss. I can't be the only one that knows what it's like to go through a season where you find it hard to just praise and worship. Life has hit you. You didn't plan to bury that person. You didn't plan to lose that person. You didn't plan for that to go wrong. But the problem is their song was never supposed to be about a land. Their song was always supposed to be about Jehovah. God did not want them to cry over the land. God wanted them to cry because of their disconnect with him. 
The land without God is nothing. It's like heaven without Jesus. Who wants to go to heaven without Jesus? Heaven without Jesus is earth part two. It is to stand before my Savior. Stand before the one that I sacrificed for. Stand before the one who never stopped chasing me. Stand before the one who healed my heart time after time after time. Stand before the one who never gave up. Stand before the one who loved me more than family, more than friends, more than careers and bosses. To stand before the one who hung up high and stretched out wide. To stand before the one who who said, I am the apple of his eye, to stand before the one that I suffered loss after loss after loss for, to finally stand before my kinsman redeemer. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all worth. We don't hear messages about heaven no more. We don't hear messages about dying no more. There was a time in the church, and I came up with old church leaders that were 40 years older than me. I was the youngest guy in my churches I came up in. And those people would get excited about dying, get excited about the rapture. Why? Because they were excited to go home with Jesus. You know why we don't hear messages about death and revelations and, and, and going home to be with Jesus no more? It's because we love our lives. And as long as we love our lives, we will never lay down our lives for him. They fell in love with the land more than the God. And it is possible to fall in love with things more than we love him. To fall in love with the man. To fall in love with the woman. To fall in love with the money. To fall in love with the job. And I know you love it more than him when he has to fight to get it from you. And that's why it takes everything out of you when it goes wrong. It's because you've made that thing a land. And if that thing's not right, you will not sing to the king. He never wanted it to be about a land. If their hearts were right in the first place, they would have been in Babylon raising their hands. They would have been in Babylon shouting. So God had to send them into Babylon for 70 years to get refocused, to get their hearts back in place. I wonder how many people in here is God saying, can the suffering end today because I have your heart back? Can the dreams start flowing again because I have your heart back? That's the question. And Jeremiah would tell them before they ever got started, you're going in for 70 years. Because God never put you in the oven without having the time in order to take you out. 70 years, but he left them with some encouragement. He told them in the midst of Babylon, while they were struggling and while they were down on the ground in tears, he told them, understand, and this is coming from God, I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I'll never forget, and it's in my Bible to this day. If I had my Bible out, I, I, would, I would bring it. Actually, Amaris, go grab it out of Jeremiah 29, 11. But I'll never forget when I was young in ministry. I was still a youth pastor, and some things went wrong, and I was ready to quit. I was ready to throw in the towel. And there it is. Just the piece of paper is good. Yeah, I was ready to quit. I was ready to throw in the towel. It was about 20 years ago, give or take. And I'm sitting in this Starbucks like, God, I just can't do this no more. I was going through my fiance called off the wedding a month before the wedding. The church 
that I was a part of at the time said no minister should be hurting this bad. So they actually sat me down in front of the church. Did not do anything immoral. I was just broken. And they said that a minister of the gospel should never be that broken if you're trusting in God. And I was just ready to quit. And as I was sitting in Starbucks, a lady walked up to me that I did not even know. I had my Bible opened, and I was still young in the faith, even though I was a minister. I had only been saved for about two years. I had gone to Bible college. I was still learning about God. It was really dumb on their part to give me a, a target on my back before they qualified me. But here I am. And I'm sitting down, and the lady puts this paper on my on my, on my table and walks away. And I looked at it. And I said, what is this? Jeremiah 29, 11. She just wrote it down on a piece of paper. And she didn't know me. I didn't even have my Bible out. I was just randomly sitting there and drinking a coffee. But I had my Bible in my car. And I ran out and I grabbed it. I opened it up. And it was, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And I remember just weeping at the Starbucks. Because right when I was ready to give up on God, yeah. his reckless love came in and said, I'm not done with you yeah. yet. Yeah. And now I look back at those things that went wrong, and I say, it was good for me. Because guess what? Now I'm in the driver's seat, and I don't do that to broken people in my church. Yeah. I know how to handle broken people in my church now. Yeah. I understand that there are going to be people that hurt, and I understand that when life hits you, I'm not going to judge you when you go into survival mode, because even if you're prodigal, you're God's child, and he's going to pull you back home. Yeah. I just want to be the one to put a note on your table in your hard season and remind you that God is not flying the plane of your life as a terrorist. He is a pilot with a landing plan. He is not looking to crash your life at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 into a building. He is a pilot with a plan. And before it's all said and done, you are going to be right where God intends for you to be. Jeremiah would come in to, to encourage them because they needed it. And God would give them heroes in a faith in a lot of ways, heroes of the faith. He would raise up just to show them that he was with them. He, he would raise up Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to, to walk it out in a bad season before them. But now the 70 years is coming to an end. And this is so cool how God begins to work things when you're getting ready to step into your good season. And I know that God would not give me a word like this unless there was somebody here ready to step into a good season. Ezra comes in and gives us an account on how God began to shift things from tragedy to triumph. The book of Ezra is written really in two parts. The first seven chapters or so are Zerubbabel taking them back into Israel from Babylon. Zerubbabel, they actually call the second temple his temple. The second part of the book of Ezra is Ezra bringing the people back. And there's actually three different journeys from Babylon. There's uh, Zerubbabel, there's Ezra, and then there's Nehemiah who brings the third group into the promised land or back to the promised land. When Ezra comes in to allow us to see how God 
is beginning to orchestrate things. Look, look, look at what he says in Ezra chapter 1. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. So he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom, and he put it in writing. Now, the cool thing about history is these stories in the Bible are not like Bible stories that can't be found in history. The release of the Jews back to, to Israel is documented in Babylonian records. So it's not just in our Bible. The Babylonians documented this. They have found scrolls and seals that talk about Cyrus because whenever the kings would put something in writing, it, it would be carved into what they call cuneiforms. But here's the catch. This King Cyrus, about 150 years before he became king, this is where the Bible gets exciting, is prophecy. And things the Bible talks about thousands of years prior or hundreds of years prior happen. We have the only book that contains prophecy. And so in Isaiah, 150 years before Persia ever heard of a guy named Cyrus, Isaiah says this, Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, you will be built and to the temple, the foundation shall be laid thereof. 150 years, Isaiah says, the eagle-eyed prophet says, there's a guy named Cyrus coming. I, I know his name. I know where he's coming from. See, the reason this had to happen is because God started planning it before Cyrus was ever born. What are, what are you trying to get at, Pastor? <laughs> Everything God has for your deliverance has been prepared before you ever needed deliverance. <laughs> Everything for your healing has already been prepared before the first call. The relationship is done. The kids getting it together. It's done. The job, it's done. The house, it's done. The resources, it's done. God prepares for what you need before you ever get into it. This is why you don't have to panic. This is why you don't have to worry. Because if God is God, he already has a plan. He already has a way. The investor is coming. The person is coming. The opportunity is is coming. God would not have put you in it unless he prepared your Cyrus in advance. He says, Cyrus will be my shepherd, but Cyrus ain't saved. God has a way of making your shepherd whatever it is that pulls you out of your pit. So when somebody says, I'm your pastor, what's the pit they ever pulled you out of? Because whenever God puts somebody into your life, whether it's through their presence, through their messages, you name it, you can recall a pit they pulled you out of. That's why you value them. That's why you fight for them. That's why you're loyal to them. Because you know that if it was not for God's presence in their life, where would you be? Cyrus, he says, is my, my shepherd. He would talk about him in another chapter uh, of Isaiah. He says in verses 2 to 3, I'm going to use Cyrus to make crooked places straight. Every crooked place in your life, God says, when I pull you out, I'm going to make it a straight thing. He says, I'll break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, hidden riches, and secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, which call you by name and the God of Israel. God says, when I pull you out of this, you are never going to question who I am to you again. How many have had God pull you out of some stuff? That's why you're here. That's why you're shouting. That's why you're clapping. That's why you give. Because God has pulled you out of some stuff. He pulled you out of some addictions. Out of some relationships. Out of some toxic situations. Say he pulled me out. 
You wouldn't have gotten out if it wasn't for him. He had to pull you out. You would still be stuck. You would still be depressed. You would still be addicted. You would still be suicidal. You would still be anxious. But God saw you and God pulled you out. Say he pulled me out. Look at your neighbor and say he's about to pull you out too. It says that when God pulled him out, he blessed them so that they would know that he was God. God begins to stir up a king that is not Hebrew. He is not Jewish. He is not a descendant of Abraham. But he is God's tool for their new season. God is about to stir up a tool for your new season. It says that Cyrus looks at his kingdom and all of his treasurers and says, here's the deal. The God of heaven told me to have his house rebuilt. I am going to build him a house. Whoever is among you, that has a heart to see this house built. Rise up. Rise up. Notice their freedom is also tied to their generosity. Their sacrifice. He says, whoever has a heart to build the house, go back home. And we're going to see how it was only a remnant that would get up. But he not only released the people, he not only told the people to make the house being built a reality through your generosity, he said this, everything Nebuchadnezzar took, the lampstands, the table of shoe bread, everything that Nebuchadnezzar took, the only thing Nebuchadnezzar did not still have was the Ark of the Covenant. From the time they were taken into Babylon till now, they have not been able to find the Ark of the Covenant. And most believe it's because Jeremiah hid it. Because he did not want that kind of glory and power to fall into the wrong hands. But everything outside of the Ark of the Covenant Cyrus says, return it. This is so rich. Because for somebody, what God wants you to hear today is everything the enemy took from you is about to come back to you. All the love he took, all the years he took, all the strength he took, all the days he took from you, all the happiness he took from you. God is saying, if you can just get focused, everything that's been taken is about to come back to you. It doesn't matter how rich it may be or how, how pathetic it may be. God says, big or small, it is all coming back. He says, send it all. And they begin the process with Zerubbabel of going back to Israel. And they are a little scared and a little hesitant. And there's controversy all around them. Chapter 4 says that when they started building, actually all of these haters began to arise. Because whenever you start building for God, whenever you give your life to God, you have to understand you have set hell on fire. The devil's not happy that you're succeeding. They had all of these haters that I'll get back to. But the haters got angry because it says in chapter 3, they, 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 they laid the foundation. 
they, they, they didn't get the whole thing built yet. They just laid the foundation. We talked about the man who dug till he hit rock, the foundation. They, they just got the foundation in order. They didn't need to see the siding, remember? They didn't need to see the roof. They got the foundation in order. And here's how you know the foundation of a person's in order. It, 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 it says they got the symbols. They started praising. And they sang responsibly. Look at this song. Continue on. Praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And this is the song. For he is good. Foundation. We don't even have our house together yet. Foundation. Because once you start to get the foundation of your faith in order, you don't need everything to be right to say God is good. Yes. You can feel he's good. You can see he's good. When you look back over your life, you can say he's good. When you look at what he's done for you, you can say he's good. When you look at where you are, you can say, man, God has been so good to me. They say God is good. His love endures to forever. Why are you praising God for his love? Because even when we were in a bad season, he had a plan. Even when we were in a bad season, he was up to something. Even when we were in a bad season, he had provision ready for us. He had opportunity ready for us. His love. And now we see why Babylon was good. Because Babylon allowed them to see that not only is God good, but God loves them. And now I understand the reason behind every scar in my life. It was to get me to a place where I could look back and see his goodness. Because often when my faith gets comfortable, God sends me a reminder through the form of trouble. To remind me that he was not just my savior on the cross, but he signed up to be my savior every day of my life. But how can I need a savior if I'm never in a place to need saving? So the people shouted with a great shout. They, they shouted. They shouted. Why? Because they were in love. They shouted. Why? Because they were, they were grateful. They shouted. Why? Because God remembered them. And I've learned that sometimes God needs to put us in a bad place to get our shout back. It's easy to sit around and judge the people that shout too much. But I've learned to be mindful of the people that never do. I'm mindful of the people that go to football games and green turtles and scream at every play in a football game or a Ravens game or an Orioles game. But can sit in church so quiet. People that care more about touchdowns than the Savior that rose. How do we turn our shout? And I'm not saying that stuff's wrong. If you go to a game with me, I'm probably going to slap you so much <laughs> that you're tired of me before the end of the game. But I'm just saying, I don't turn it on for one thing and off for God. Yeah. Because when I look at my life, I see his love. I see his goodness. And they shouted. And it says, they shouted. Why? And praise the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And the priests and the Levites and the fathers of the houses, the fathers of the houses, the fathers of the houses, fathers of the houses, fathers. How long is it going to take you to open your mouth for your house? Yeah. The fathers of the house. You can't expect the kids to shout at the fathers, don't. 
You can't expect the families to shout if the fathers don't. You can't expect the marriage to shout if the husband don't. And the fathers shouted. And it was so loud, you could not distinguish the joyful shouts from the tears. Why were people crying? They were crying because Babylon was so hard. You know you're ready to come out of something where you're not too hard or too cold to hold your tears in. Play a man all you want. All God sees is you're not ready. It's at that point when that thing breaks you so bad. Every mother here will tell you there is a yell your kids make that will make you backhand them or in some families maybe soft talk, Johnny. You know. <laughs> there, there is that. There is that yell. And then there's the yell that will make you drop all the dishes and run. It's a scream. And you know that scream. And God says, the way you've been yelling is the reason I've been backhanding you. I'm waiting for a scream. I'm waiting for a shout. I'm waiting for a cry. And when the Hebrew people cried, God said, Moses, now it's time. Until God sees a broken and contrite spirit, the Bible calls it. You, my friend, need a little longer in the oven. They were broken. Babylon broke them. Babylon did its job. It took them down to their knees. It took every tear out of their tear ducts. Babylon had them depressed. Babylon had them questioning their faith. And the fact that you love me enough, God, to come back for me, and there were still people, the Bible says, amongst the group that were weeping the loudest because they came back to rubble. But they remember Solomon's glory. They remembered the glory of yesterday. And they were crying because they were ready for the glory again. There are some that have been broken that are here. And there are some that have been on a journey out of church for a long season looking for God's glory again. Looking to feel it the way you felt it before. Looking to hear like you heard before. Looking to be inspired like you were inspired before. And God got what he wanted because the foundation of the temple was not the big thing to God because he doesn't live in temples. The foundation of the temple being built was a representation of them getting back to their foundations. And God is saying today, it is time for somebody to get back to your foundation. Back to how your grandmom taught you. Back to how your grandfather taught you. Back to what your father told you to do. Back to how your mother taught you to pray. It's time to get back to your foundation. Because God says, if I can find somebody today that says, Lord, I'm getting back to my foundation. God says, I will turn your Cyrus's heart. Your Cyrus may be a wife. 
Your Cyrus may be a husband. Your Cyrus may be a boss. And you're mad at them not realizing that God will turn their hearts when he gets yours. So the people are weeping. And the enemy is angry because the enemy thought he won. How many times I look back over my life, and I like to call them close calls, where the enemy thought he had me. And truthfully, I thought the enemy had me. And God just stepped in. The enemy thought he had them. He thought it was over. But when he saw that foundation, he knew if I let this thing go, glory is coming back. And that's why somebody in here is under so much attack. Because the enemy knows if he can stop you now, he will stop your glory from filling what you're built. You will stop his glory from filling what you've been building. But here's the good news. When it's your season, it's your season. Yeah. It says the enemy went to the king, Darius, is, and, and began to try to, because it's a new king now, Darius. They, they went to Darius and they said, they're doing this. They're trying to take your glory. They're trying to make their God bigger than our kingdom. And it says that in, in Ezra 6, when, when the king got done listening to them, he, he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. I want a decree sent out that anybody that messes with them gets hung. I want a decree sent out that all the money they need is to be given. Because they didn't quit when the enemies came. God sent the money. God sent the protection. And even with the remnant they have, the little bit they have, they were able to finish because God was not concerned with what they had. God was not concerned about the remnant that went back, the rubble that they had to work with. Because a remnant with God is more than enough. It doesn't matter how out of control your life feels right now. It doesn't matter how small the resources, whether it's Moses' rod or the little pot of oil or the little boy's lunch in the multitude with Jesus. Your little bit in the hands of a big God is more than enough. Look at somebody and say, I've got what I need. Even down to a remnant. They were good because God sent them money the remnant could not earn. God sent them protection that the remnant could not give or provide for themselves. And today, God sent me here to tell you, as we kick off this series, that even down to a little bit, if he can get you to focus on him, and focus on your foundation. He will show you through the provision and the protection that you've got everything that you need. And the glory of this latter shall be better than the former. I know the 70 years were rough. But there is a bigger glory getting ready to come into your life. There is a filling about to come into your life. And if God can get you focused again, this is a season to not just return, but remain. Amen. 
As I close this message out, dealing with the remnant that went back, it reminds me of a scripture in Revelation 3 where God is talking to the church of Sardia. And, and they have a lot of people that are out of order, but there's a remnant that's doing it right. And God, through John, tells him to tell the remnant a message. He says, tell the remnant. And I love this verse. Strengthen what remains. Don't look at what you lost, but strengthen what remains. Don't look at who left you, but strengthen what remains. Don't look at the years you've lost, but strengthen what remains. Don't, 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 don't look at the little bit of money you have to work with. God is saying, use what I've given you and strengthen what remains. Don't get so focused on the little that you stop strengthening what God has given you to work with. Because he does his greatest work when we are down to a little bit. And as we're going to see over the next five weeks or so, God would take this little bit and build something so great. He would take this little bit and rebuild something that even without the Ark of the Covenant would experience his glory show up. In a way, it never showed up before. So to all the people who feel like you're down to a little and your life is nothing but broken pieces, God is about to show you in this series how with a little bit, he can take your broken pieces and build something amazing. So today is the kickoff to better for the glory of this house. This latter house will be better than the former. Better than before.